I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. July 16th, 1945. 5.30 a.m. is the moment when there is a second sunburst for the first time in human history. Trinity Test. In the bunker, watching Trinity Test are significant characters in a new book, Churchill's Bomb, how the United States overtook Britain in the first nuclear arms rage. Uh, Graham Farmello is the author. This is the nuke story told as I've never read it. The facts here support that it wasn't an American bomb. It was the American ingenuity to steal it from the British. Graham, a very good evening to you. In the bunker at the control center, 5.30 a.m., Leslie Groves commanding the effort to build the gadget. Van Neer Bush, who commanded the scientists of America at the hands of FDR. Conant, the professor, the Harvard uh, scholar, and Don, who'd overseen a deal of the, of the filtering of what information flowed into America in the war with Hitler and with uh, uh, Japan. And, of course, Oppenheimer, Oppie, the man who headed up the science efforts at Site Y at Los Alamos. But the one I want to focus on is one of your heroes. His name is Chadwick. Who is he at that moment? Where did he come from? Good evening to you, Graham. Ah, good evening, John. Well, yes, Chadwick, a, a, a great figure. Um, Chadwick uh, was uh, a, one of the great experimental physicists of the 20th century. He was the person who discovered the, uh, part, the subatomic particle called the neutron. And that's, that's a particle in, uh, in the core of most atoms. And he discovered that in uh, 1932, and that pretty well established him as the world's leading uh, experimental nuclear physicist at the time. Um, and what happened uh, was that uh, uh, was that, that Chadwick, uh, in the course of the story we're going to tell, uh, uh, migrated to the United States and headed up a relatively small British mission yeah, as part of the Manhattan Project, and he was there in the bunker, as you vividly described there, about to see what he regarded as the greatest experiment in scientific history, you know, in terms of its, uh, in terms of its, uh, the, the monumental size of the gamble he was looking at. Let's go so, back to 1932, because he's sure. Jimmy Chadwick, and he's deputy to the great Rutherford, uh, running yep. the Cavendish Lab at Oxford. Who is uh, at, Cambridge, Cambridge, no, at Cambridge. Cambridge? At Cambridge. Who is yep. Rutherford? What What is his significance to all of these uh, physicists who build the bomb? Well, R- Rutherford w- uh, was the was the monarch of nuclear uh, nuclear physics, so to speak. He was the person who actually discovered that every atom has at its core a tiny, nu- tiny, tiny nucleus where most of the mass of the atom is concentrated. And what at- what uh, Rutherford did was he was the person who uh, who, who not, not just discovered that nucleus, but showed uh, the origin of radioactivity, where the nuclei can fall apart and form other. Uh, other uh, d- types of nucleus giving off uh, radioactivity. So that was that. That was one of the reasons why he was so so important. And as you say, he was leader of the Cavendish Laboratory in 1932, and was effectively Chadwick's boss. What's interesting was that uh, Rutherford was actually a skeptic. He very much doubted whether this nuclear energy that he knew all about would ever be harnessed so that it could be used for nuclear power or indeed for nuclear bomb. So he was, if you like, a nuclear skeptic. Uh, And he actually uh, died in 1937 before any of this came to to fruition. So Rutherford never saw the story uh, that uh, we're, we're about to relate. This is 1932 when Jimmy Chadwick is deputy to Rutherford and all of the players in this drama are standing back from this theory that you can crack the atom, that there is something inside of it. Graham, I know it sounds strange, but the invention of the atomic bomb takes place in the imagination of the great science fiction writer H.G. Wells. How does he do it? Well, it was almost exactly a hundred years ago, and I mean almost exactly to the month, that H.G. Wells coined the term atomic bombs. He read uh, in a book of popular lectures Uh, about this nuclear energy that was stored up in the core of of many, many heavy atoms. 
and the uh, the lecturer in that he, he read said that one day we might be able to harness this energy. Now Wells's genius was to take a little thread like that and yank it and, and t- weave it into a rich tapestry of a story. And that's what he did in a book called The World Set Free, where he first spoke about these atomic bombs, so to speak, where he actually talked about harnessing the, 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 this nuclear energy, and he envisioned a catastrophic nuclear war. So this book was extremely far-sighted in, in, in many ways. One of the readers of H.G. Wells and someone who himself fancied uh, his imagination and his tongue is the hero of Churchill's bomb, Winston mm-hmm. Churchill himself. And at the time, because they're so ambitious, they're, mm-hmm. uh, they're looking at each other and yep. how they're doing. That's Chur- right. Churchill keeps an eye on Wells. Why? All the way through, uh, Wells lives until 46. What, what does Churchill uh, take from Wells? Uh, Churchill regarded Wells as a truly great writer, sec- perhaps second only to George uh, Ber- Bernard Shaw, who, who Churchill revered very strongly. The key thing about Wells was this uh, was this uh, ability that he had to look into the future. It, well, uh, Churchill called him a seer. Uh, Wells had this ability to uh, take from contemporary science these little threads and to extract from them very powerful predictions about things uh, about science and indeed technology in the future L- later on uh, it, it, um, Churchill was the person who for Great Britain oversaw the implementation of the tank the weapon the tank uh, in the first world war uh, and he credited H.G. Uh, Wells with the invention of that weapon, and that's what Churchill was. He was a future orientated politician, and he saw Wells as someone who could feed him and others ideas that the military could use and need to be aware of. In other words, what I'm learning from you, Graham, is before the physics, before the neutron is imagined, before uh, Chadwick and his uh, uh, and his colleagues mm. work on uh, accelerators or cracking the neutron, before all yep. that, there's the language of an atomic bomb, yep. and that language appeals to a man, Churchill, who becomes a very important figure in the first war mm. uh, through the uh, the troubles of the Gallipoli failure. That's through right. the he he goes to the trenches, he comes back, he uh, points. Points to the uh, the land ironclads is what Wells called them the tank, That's and right. through that time Churchill is thinking of looking to the future. Churchill writes a, a short story, I believe it's in 1931, the world 50 years hence. Does he in, does he talk about the atomic bomb in that story? He talks uh, directly about the release of nuclear energy in that story, and amazingly, he actually talks there uh, uh, about. Uh, what we would now call the hydrogen bomb, about ha- about harnessing the uh, energy from, uh, by fusing together uh, uh, light atoms. But in particular, he's focusing on harnessing energy from, a, uh, from what we now call uh, atomic nuclei. And he actually uses the phrase there that uh, what, what is needed before this, uh, this energy can be harnessed and released is a uh, match to, to light the nuclear bonfire, as he, as, as he called it. And whoa, uh, blow me down, uh, that essay was published in November 1931, right. and Chadwick discovered the neutron, which turned out to be that nuclear match, just two months later. Uh, Graham Farmello is the author of Churchill's Bomb, How the United States Overtook Britain in the First Nuclear Arms Race. We'll get to the physicist now, but it's important to follow. This is Churchill's story, his imagination, his rhetoric, broadcast to the world in a war they can't imagine in the early 1930s. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. John Batchelor, this is the John Batchelor Show, Churchill's Bomb, how the United States overtook Britain in the first nuclear arms race. Graham Farmello is the author. I defer to the author's choice of overtook. Another word would be stole, but we're going to plow now into the British 
genius for the idea of splitting the atom. It, however, this is Churchill's story as well, so we have to begin with a very unusual person, someone out of a fairy tale, except for he's real. His name is Lindemann. He's born in Germany. His father is a German. They emigrate to Great Britain in 1870. By the time he comes on the scene for Churchill, he is a very well-regarded professor at Oxford, at Christ Church, I believe. He was recommended that post by the great Rutherford. Graham, how do we tell the story of Lindemann quickly? What is he to Churchill when he first meets him? He is, a, as you rightly say, a very distinguished scientist. Uh, he uh, earned his stripes as, a, as an inventor and as a, as, a, as a physicist. He knew Einstein well. He knew all the important people. He was a professor of physics at Oxford, uh, at, charged with setting up a laboratory to, to rival the Rutherford's. So he goes to see uh, Ch- Churchill. They meet at one of the wealthiest uh, houses in Britain, and uh, Lindemann pursues Churchill. Initially, they didn't get on that brilliantly, but they become firm friends. And despite uh, Lindemann's uh, eccentricities and outrageous social climbing and uh, all other manner of uh, things, Churchill does take to him because Lindemann was nothing if not extremely loyal. And that's what he did. He virtually worshipped uh, Churchill uh, uh, pr- uh, privately, and he became his uh, chief scientific advisor, displacing Wells, whom Lindemann had no time for at all. Uh, he becomes his advisor at the Admiralty and then uh, at, the, uh, at the Premiership, but that's later in the decade. That's actually in the 40s. Or this yes. is a t- period of time when Churchill is wandering the earth discarded, actually, by his own party. I think Baldwin was in power. Mm. Churchill goes to America in 29. Mm. He's drifting. He's looking for a purpose. Yes. What does Churchill make of science? Why does he want Lindemann around him? Well, uh, several reasons. The one we've already mentioned, that, uh, that, that uh, Lindemann actually briefed him on a lot of articles, science articles, where Churchill became the most prominent journalist in the 1930s, uh, who was actually writing about about nuclear energy. This was in the 30s, before anyone had even heard about uh, bombs and nuclear power and what have you. But, but much more important was that Lindemann was at his side when Churchill was... Uh, was warning about the uh, about the rise of Hitler and the uh, uh, and the tremendous rearmament of uh, of Germany, and what uh, Lindemann did was uh, was was be his scientific advisor and to uh, ad- advise Churchill on Britain's uh, in, in Lindemann's opinion failure to um, uh, equip itself. Uh, in a way that would enable them to handle the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, if they were to attack Britain. The fear was that Hitler could do a slam-dunk attack in one go and knock out London, so to speak. And what uh, Churchill, uh, very much egged on and supported by Lindemann, what they wanted to do was was develop air defences, and that became the core celebre for for Churchill and Lindemann in the 30s. Right, in the 30s, I learned from Graham, Air attacks by bombers were considered as apocalyptic as we regard nuclear energy now, nuclear weapons now. So, uh, but before we get to the Air Defense Committee and Churchill's place on it in 35, Mm. there's an immigration story here as well, Graham. My note Mm. says of the 67 physicists who arrived in the United Kingdom before the war, all of them refugees from the Hitlerites and the discrimination and the pursuit of them. Only three found work in Great Britain. 32 emigrated, mostly to the U.S. Mm. Why did Britain turn away these geniuses coming from the continent? Mm. I wish I could answer that. I'm rather embarrassed on behalf of my country. They they did get assistance and support from the uh, Academic uh, Assistance Council, which uh, which Rutherford was a leading light. But uh, Lindemann played a cleverer game. Uh, He went uh, in his chauffeur-driven Rolls-Royce, uh, in 1933, into Hitler's Germany and sought out people he knew were at risk under the under the awful uh, uh, under the awful business, uh, regime, if you if, if I might call it that, of of, of Hitler, and he uh, made it possible. This is Lindemann made it possible for many of those scientists to come to work in Oxford and indeed other laboratories. 
So, uh, so Lindemann uh, saw a chance to do good, so to speak, but also do, to do well for himself in recruiting some of the best brains. And he got some tremendous people, uh, people like Francis Simon um, and even the great quantum physicist uh, Erwin Schrödinger. So uh, Oxford really, that, that was Lindemann's uh, uh, university, did very, very well from uh, those emigre scientists who were desperate, of course, to, to leave Germany. Uh, one of the scientists who emigrated who did not uh, did not enjoy welcome was Leo Szilard, the Hungarian. I hope I say it correctly. That's correct, Szilard. And yeah. he is uh, turned away. He doesn't find a home. He's, he's hard scrabble. In fact, he heads to New York at some point, having picked up where the English, uh, where the British are with nuclear physics. Does he have in him the genius of a fission? Does he tell Fermi that at, in Columbia? Yes. Uh, what Szilard did, he, he was the person, he'd read the H.G. Wells novel that we, uh, that we spoke about earlier, and he, at least by his account, was the first person to dream up this idea of a nuclear chain reaction, ah. whereby uh, you, you could have a kind, uh, something like a forest fire among nuclei, where there would be one reaction, uh, one following another and following another, and, and the whole thing could go critical and form a nuclear bomb. And he was, became very, very concerned that... Uh, that uh, that it would be possible to build a fission, a nuclear fission bomb, uh, and that ch- that um, Hitler's scientists could do that and give that weapon to Hitler. Does he tell that to Fermi when he gets to the Columbia University? Oh yes, he was telling every, he was talking, telling people in Britain as well, and very few people listened to him. It has to be said, one of the people that didn't listen to him was Rutherford. Oh. There were plenty of people that didn't take uh, Szilard that uh, that that seriously, but to be, he was a handful. Szilard, to be perfectly honest, he was a very much a law unto himself. Um, but nonetheless, he was ahead of the game on, uh, on this uh, All right, he's turned away along with a lot of other geniuses here who wind up in America by yeah. default. Mm. We need to go to the Air Defense Committee because this Air Defense Research Committee, Churchill joins it according to my note in early 35. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tizards is on the committee and so is Lindemann. What's its, what's its role? What's its mission? Well, uh, Tizard, Tizard was seen as, uh, as the, uh, by his colleagues as the greatest person. Uh, uh, he was a good scientist, not as good as uh, Lindemann, incidentally, but a good, very good scientist. He was rector good. of the Imperial College, Henry Tizard. That's right. And he was seen as someone who was absolutely brilliant at taking uh, uh, scientists and modern scientific knowledge and applying it in such a way that it was useful to the to the military and he was as i said regarded as without peer uh, uh, in in that realm and uh, he was one of the people who was leading the development of radar and this is the, the thing that lindemann and also by by, by that token Churchill were initially quite skeptical that radar was the way to go and there was one hell of a fight in that on that committee uh, it was an absolute uh, well, but we would now say bloodbath, uh, where, whereby uh, Lindemann and Tizard fell out. And although they got back together again uh, afterwards in, in various guys, but they they basically were extremely wary of each other. And uh, and Lindemann in particular wanted Tizard off the playing it's field. It's important to watch these fights between the scientists because they're happening all around Churchill, who will become the man who leads yep. in the Second War. The book is Churchill's Bomb: How the United States Overtook Britain in the First Nuclear Arm. Race. Graham Farmello is the author. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Graham Farmello's comprehensive story of first the imagining of the atomic bomb and then the physics of the atomic bomb all inside of this turmoil that we now know as the Great Depression and the recovery from the First War, then the Great Depression and then the Second World War. The physicists who are arriving, who've heard of these stories at this point, all regard the idea of splitting an atom or creating fission as imaginative, but no one's ever done it. They're just, they're theoretical physicists at this point. I'm speaking to Graham about the committees that are formed 
in Great Britain, the Air Defense Committee is one of them, that is open to new ideas. The atomic weapon is not at the top. In fact, many times it's disregarded as moonshine. Wasn't that uh, uh, Rutherford's name for it before he died, moonshine? That's right. Yep. Yes, he, he, he really thought the whole idea of harnessing nuclear weapons was, uh, was, uh, w- w- was something that was, was really quite fanciful. I mean, a, key, a really key thing in this story is that just after Rutherford died, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, two physicists working in Hitler's capital discovered this, uh, the phenomenon of nuclear fission, whereby if you bombard a uranium nucleus with, uh, with a, uh, a neutron, you can, you can cleave it, basically split it in half and release what by atomic standards is a huge amount of energy. And this was the discovery that opened the way uh, to, uh, to the idea of a fission bomb. It wasn't a straightforward matter by any stretch of the imagination, but that concept of nuclear fission was absolutely vital. And it happened right on the eve of the Second World You're War. You're talking about fish, fate. fish and piles? 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 Piles. Fish yes. and piles. This is in Germany... In 1937, is my is that correct? Is no, that well, hold on, no, forgive yeah. me. Uh, no, uh, the, 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 it was Harlan Strassman who uh, who, I, who yes. made the, the discovery. The, 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 what, what what would be helpful in our story is to say that uh, although some people were concerned, uh, it was uh, um, it was very unlikely that uh, a bomb would be built according to the very best minds, in particular Niels Bohr, because he worked out. Uh, with his colleagues in Princeton one day, and I know you want to talk about this, uh, that uh, that ordinary uranium wouldn't uh, cut right. it here. Let's you introduce need... let's introduce Niels Bohr because he yeah. becomes a refugee from the Hitlerites as yep. early as nineteen. Uh, my note here says nineteen thirty eight. Uh, the uh, the anti Jewish hysteria in Germany was overwhelming, and at this point, Bohr sees that the future is not bright for him, and it's not it's not bright for a lot of these physicists. Mm-hmm. However, it's Niels Bohr who also throws uh, hot uh, cold water on this. He doesn't think the bomb can be built. Why not, Graham? Well. Uh- well, he, he, working with, uh, with, with John Wheeler uh, and others, um, but those two particularly worked out that uh, the, the, the kind of fission that would give rise to a nuclear weapon would only, uh, would only take place in a, what's called a particular isotope, a particular type of uranium called U-235, which is extremely rare so rare that it would take enormous resources to take natural uranium and uh, distill, so to speak, enough of that uranium-235 to make a bomb possible. So Bohr said you'd have to have an entire country putting its resources uh, behind such a project. So he, well, so he said it was just inconceivable. And he gave a lecture in Copenhagen shortly after the war uh, broke out, telling his audience that they, basically they could forget about uh, you know, the, 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 the horrifying prospect of, of a, such a powerful bomb. The really big step that was taken, which Bohr knew nothing about, because he was uh, in in uh, in Copenhagen uh, uh, when the when the war start, uh, started, took place in Birmingham in the Midlands in uh, in, in England, when two uh, physicists classed as enemy aliens by the British government, they hit upon the idea of uh, of how you could actually build a weapon, a nuclear weapon, and that was to actually take two uh, lumps of, of that special fissile type of uranium, U-235, and fire them at very high energy together so that they would form what's called a critical mass so that you get a chain reaction happening very quickly and then an explosion. This is Otto, wrote, Otto, Otto Frisch and Rudy Parles. That's right. Right. Absolutely right. They were. In fact, you know, one of the interesting things was uh, they weren't allowed to work on radar. They were in a laboratory that was working on radar, but that was regarded as too secret for them. So they were, they were busy working on the much less secret matter of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of nuclear physics. And they, uh, probably in the first or second week of March 1940, when Neville Chamberlain was prime minister, they hit on that idea in an office in, uh, at the University of Birmingham. And they wrote an absolute classic paper called the Frisch Piles Memorandum, which sets out for non-specialists on, in a few pages how you could build that bomb, very roughly speaking, and uh, it, uh, what its impact would be if you dropped it on a city. 
the fresh piles uh, working together, mm. that becomes a story that the committees in, at Whitehall are mm. going to work on, but they don't trust them. They won't put them on the committee. I think they eventually invent a subcommittee so that that's they right. can participate oh. in their own invention. And yeah. that's part of your story, Graham. The, the British government, the English government, does mm. not trust the information it's getting from the refugees no. because of what? Security concerns or their, their lingering doubts about German spies or because they're, they don't trust people with accents? I, I can't quite solve this because eventually they all, all this information flows to America where there's an equal sense of paranoia all the time, mm. but they accept the information. They don't, they don't block it out. Yeah, well, I, uh, they, uh, th- 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 to be fair, that, the, the, where and Pals wrote this memorandum, which their boss, Oliphant, sent to London, and it was given a fair and quick hearing, uh, and they set up what, a, a particular committee called the Maud uh, Maud Committee to investigate the possibility. This, of this. is the, it, the famous say, Maud, it, it, the Maud Report, right? The Maud that's Committee. That's right, right. That's right. And, and a report was eventually written, uh, f- uh, finished off mainly by by Chadwick, uh, and it uh, and it r- roughly speaking concluded that a bo- uh, that it looked like a bomb was going to be. Uh, be possible. I don't think it's right to say they shut the, the idea out. I think that they did look at it, and it was seen as very, very speculative, remember. We, you know, we're talking about huge sums of money right. and great concerns that this thing would never affect the war because it would take too, uh, too long. Right? Uh, but you're, you're right that uh, the uh, enemy aliens, as they were for quite a time, they were treated with some mistrust. That is certainly In true. In 1940, everyone was detained. They were, they were putting them into concentration areas, I remember. And, and that you, you had to carry your identity papers all the time and you were blocked out. So, okay, I'm not blaming. I'm just no, fascinated no, no, because correct. because the Maud report... Oh, let's tell. What is the Maud for? How do they name that report? Because it's a very funny uh, origin. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, everybody was completely paranoid about uh, about, about what about this was. It, it, turned, it was it, in the end, it, it was a misinterpretation of a, uh, of a cable that came from Bohr and uh, it, and in that was talking about Maud Ray uh, Kent, uh, and what, what, what this this referred to was the governess of uh, Niels Bohr's children in Kent. But they thought it was something much more sinister than that. And they it became the Maud terrible Re- going on behind right. Enemy it became lines. the Maud report, and the Maud report now is in the hands of a committee. There are yeah. many committees. They're meeting all the time. Churchill is in between. He goes to Admiralty and then he's going to go to the Premiership yep. after, after Chamberlain resigns, famously mm. in 1940. But before Churchill takes control and brings Lindemann in, yep. Mark Oliphant, I think he goes to America before Churchill's Prime Minister. Mm-hmm. And he takes with him the knowledge of the Maud Report. Who was Mark Oliphant? Mark Oliphant? Sir Marcus Lawrence Elwyn Oliphant. What do we need to know about him? Well, he was uh, Australian-born, uh, one of Rutherford's uh, well, yeah, uh, uh, students. Uh, he was he uh, was the boss of Frisham Piles in Birmingham, and he was the person who steered their great idea, their brilliant revelation, into the committees in the House of Commons. And he, sorry, not House of Commons, excuse me, into Whitehall in London. And Oliphant, as you rightly say, went off uh, to uh, the United States. Uh, to urge his American colleagues. He, he, he was very, very well connected. Uh, and he was uh, one of the people who urged uh, people like Lawrence and indeed Oppenheimer to take uh, the, uh, the, the, the matter of a possibility of a nuclear bomb seriously. There, there's a moment in your book, Graham, where you say that Oppenheim, uh, that Oliphant is sitting with Oppenheimer, I think it's at Berkeley, mm. and he tells him about the Maud report and what Frisch and Piles have conceived. Mm. And it's the first time Oppenheimer ever imagines they're going to create a fission bomb. Is that correct? Mm. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Uh, uh, so o- Oppenheimer was like a Pied Piper. He was going around the United States urging people to take this seriously. They, people were courtesy of Szilard looking at this, but people, uh, people were not galvanized. And that's what, uh, that's what uh, Olif- Oliphant saw his role as being. He, he wanted to galvanize the the American uh, the, the, the the Americans into taking uh, I want to give proper seriously. credit to Otto Frisch and Rudy Piles here because yes. my note from you says they worked this out on the back.
back of an envelope. That's right. And two hemispheres of U-235 driven together would be the equivalent of 10 billion, I mean, it would be 10 billion heats and 1,000 tons of TNT. In other words, they imagined what we now know as the atomic bomb. Oh, without question. Yeah, without question. And the people who worked on that report did a lot of pioneering work, some of it experimental, some of it theoretical, developing those ideas. Henry Tizard was on the committee. Did Churchill know about this committee's work? uh, Yes, but it would, to be fair, it would be very low on his list of priorities, frankly. I mean, uh, Britain and its empire uh, had it, had uh, their, their, their back to the wall, as, as everyone right. knows. So right. This, he this becomes be premier. He list. becomes the premier in May. That report is March of forty. He learns. He would have learned about it, but he had a lot of other things on his mind in May when he takes over from Chamberlain. When we come back, we're going to follow the Maud report to America, and what uh, another man with a great deal of political power makes of it. That would be Frank Roosevelt, the President of the United States. The book is Churchill's Bomb, How the United States Overtook Britain in the First Nuclear Arms Race. Graham Farmello is the author. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. John Batchelor, this is The John Batchelor Show. Graham Farmello, his new book is Churchill's Bomb, How the United States Overtook Britain in the First Nuclear Arms Race. There are stories here that are numbing. They make my mouth keep dropping open when I realize what these very brave and very, very restless men are talking about and communicating about from Britain to America back and forth. This is while Britain is in the war and America is not. Frank Roosevelt is running a re-election campaign, his third election. In 1940, he kept us out of war. No way American boys are going to go die in Europe. That's the campaign. At the same time, Roosevelt is dealing with Churchill, who's his prime minister now, from May. Churchill was not the first choice. He was the second choice after Chamberlain resigned. But in any event, he's prime minister and he's fighting the waves of bombers hitting the English cities, burning the English cities. He needs a lifeline. The U-boats have almost cut Britain off. They're starving. That's the fact of it. And but for the resupply from America and but for the help he can get from the American arsenal of democracy is what uh, Roosevelt will eventually call for it. Britain is finished. All of Europe is now under Nazi sway. And at this moment, uh, Hitler and Stalin are working together. The non-aggression pact is in place and that will stay in place until June of 41. So between May of 40 and June of 41, uh, Churchill is desperate. He's eager to get anything he can out of the United States. Here's the puzzle, Graham. Churchill has the bomb in front of him. He does not reach for it. He does not believe that it can be moved fast enough to solve the problems he's got in front of him. When Oliphant gets to America... He tells Oppenheimer and others about the bomb. Uh, FDR hears about it, and he acts on it immediately by turning to a man named Bush, Van De- Vanier Bush. What does what does Roosevelt believe or understand about the bomb that makes him move so quickly? Well, uh, uh, Vannevar Bush, uh, who was basically the head of, uh, of, of, of the king of science, as he was termed by some British people, uh, was a great appointment of, uh, of, of FDR. And uh, the bomb uh, was, was one of the projects that, uh, that he sponsored, so to speak, and drove through with uh, his uh, deputy, uh, Conant, formerly uh, uh, pre- uh, president of, uh, of, of Harvard. Uh, Einstein uh, had written a letter drafted by Zillard warning uh, the president of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of, of the need to build a bomb uh, lest the, the, the Nazis get, get there first. But it was Bush and his colleagues who really st- 
steered the uh, the uh, the bomb through uh, through through uh, the White House, so to speak. This is forty one before the U.S. is in the war. Yeah, uh, uh, Churchill knows that he needs the U.S.'s help, but he needs lend lease more than he needs their help. He needs yep. he needs to uh, in in some way drag or pull or push America into the war. They have the Maud report. It's going back and forth. Mm. The puzzle is who tells Roosevelt. To force this, they, they, my note here says that Roosevelt and Churchill first communicated about the bomb October of 1941. Who's, yep. who's that, telling? This, this, I think, is, is quite important because uh, a, a couple of months before that, uh, in October 41, Churchill wrote a memo that he was later in life extremely proud of, uh, in which he uh, basically gave the go ahead to a, a British nuclear project. Now, it needs to be said that we now know that Britain couldn't possibly have gone, uh, uh, built the bomb uh, on, on its own. But nonetheless, uh, he, he said, I don't want to stand in the, in the way of, uh, of progress, so uh, uh, let's go ahead with, uh, w- w- with this project, which incidentally was then transferred to, uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the running by Imperial Chemical Industries, one of the largest firms in Britain, and uh, uh, was uh, in the judgment of many people not particularly well, well managed. What FDR did in October 41, uh, in, in the, uh, early in that month, was to write a short note, which was hand-delivered to Churchill, offering uh, a, a joint uh, running of that nuclear let project. Me, let me read the memo. It's very important. This is 12 yeah. October 1941. My dear Winston, writes the president, it appears desirable that we should soon correspond or converse concerning the subject which is under study by your MAUD, M-A-U-D, all caps, committee, and by Dr. Bush's organization in this country, mm-hmm. in order that any extended efforts may be coordinated or even jointly conducted. That's very important. Coordinated and jointly conducted. Yeah. So at this point, Roosevelt is offering to work with the British scientists to, yeah. build, a, uh, to build a bomb or to investigate a bomb. Well, initially investigate, but but you, as you could see there that, 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 that things were really hotting up because uh, the, the British scientists determined that it was it really did look extremely feasible, right? right? Uh, but, uh, but we now know, of course, that it was much more difficult than those British scientists uh, 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 at first understood. But let's be clear: that offer was on the table, and Churchill uh, did not respond to that memo for about seven weeks. And uh, in the interim, of course, a lot happens because at the, in December 7th, the United States is attacked and it it's now in the war. Yep. And Churchill comes to America that Christmas. He has yep. a mild heart attack, right? He has a heart attack mm-hmm. in the White House mm-hmm. and he recovers. He's always recovering from strokes and heart attacks. Amazing. He's a yeah, remarkable organism. Yeah. In any event, at this point in that conversation, those first <laughs> weeks in the White House, the Christmas mm-hmm. 41, do Bush, uh, do, uh, does Churchill... Does Churchill speak to the president about the bomb? Uh, he does. Uh, the documents uh, show a, a pretty low level of discussion, it has to be said. Uh, uh, he, he, Churchill's officials do say if, if, the, if the president ra- raises the bomb, etc. But this was not uh, very high on their agenda, it has to be said. What happened after the Americans uh, uh, w- entered the war was that... Uh, was that the the American effort grew hugely, and the, and, and gradually the the British were I w- I would say sidelined from the uh, fr- uh, from the running of the project. Initially, there, there were uh, was close collaboration at the beginning at the scientific level, but uh, eventually Bush and Conant. Uh, Seeing that the Americans were going to be bankrolling this project, that, that's the key point. It was going to be American money and huge amounts of, uh, of financial uh, of, of labor investment. So far as they, they were concerned, uh, it was perfectly acceptable in their view uh, to, uh, to, to give Britain only a, a, a walk-on role in the project. The book is Churchill's Bomb. It's now uh, beginning of 1942. Britain and America are in a war against Germany and Japan. When we come back, Graham Farmello, how the United States overtook Britain in the first nuclear arms race. Uh, We're going to go to Hyde Park and a meeting between the prime minister, the president, with Harry Hopkins watching in the heat of June. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. (laughs) 